Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the American Floral Endowments Grow Pro webinar series. I'm your moderator, Michael Wojcinski, and I'm a grower for Bell Nursery in Springfield, Ohio. I help oversee and manage the production of a wide variety of ornamentals for hundreds of stores across the country. Today's session is on cut flower production in the northern U.S. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited to be part of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series that features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to everyone thanks to the generous support of AFE sponsors. This session is sponsored by Ball Seed. Ball Seed is North America's leading wholesale horticultural distributor, combining extensive experience, innovative thinking, and world-class customer service. They source world-class breeding and product development that drives new sales, delight the customer, and generate demand. If you'd like to learn more about our sponsor, or if you're a supplier and interested in becoming a sponsor for a topic, you can find that information on AFE's website at endowment.org slash grow pro. Today's session was pre-recorded in English by Dr. Roberto Lopez. After the presentation, Dr. Lopez will join us for a Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature or chat at any time. We'll answer as many as we can before the end of the hour. Unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being recorded and will be shared to AFE's YouTube account through YouTube's accessibility features, you can access closed captions in other languages. To get us started, I'd like to share a bit about today's speaker. Dr. Roberto Lopez is an Associate Professor and Controlled Environment for Culture Extension Specialist. With a 45% research, 30% teaching, and 25% extension appointment in the Department of Horticulture at Michigan State University. His research focuses on propagation and production of young and finished plants in greenhouses, growth rooms, containers, warehouse-based fact plant factories, and vertical farms. The primary objective of his research is to determine how light, substrate, and air temperature and carbon dioxide in controlled environmental agriculture production influence crop timing, rooting, yield, quality, flavor, nutrition, and subsequent performance. Dr. Lopez, welcome and thank you for presenting on cut flower production in the northern U.S. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about cut flower production in the northern U.S. and how you be can become successful in doing this. But first, I wanted to um, give an overview of what are specialty cut flowers. Well, they are basically anything other than roses, carnations, and mums. And um, one of the reasons that folks are, are moving towards uh, specialty cut flowers is that there is high consumer demand. Um, they're well worth over $480 million in the U.S., and about 90% of it is, is wholesale. One of the reasons that these um, cut flowers are not imported is that they don't ship well, and they uh, oftentimes have short uh, post-harvest space life. So just to give you some statistics on specialty cuts um, from 2019 to 2021, the number of cut flower producers has increased. Now, this is looking at producers with sales of over $100,000. Um, it's increased from 296 to 404. So there's many, many more smaller scale producers. Um, as is, would be expected, California accounts for about 69% of these specialty cut flower growers. Um, and one of the reasons that we're seeing such a large increase is that consumers are wanting new, diverse, and as well as locally grown uh, cut flowers. However, it can be challenging to produce cut flowers, especially in northern um, latitudes across the United States, because um, you know most production obviously occurs outdoors or in high tunnels. But um, obviously, you know during those winter months, it's going to be very difficult. Um, if you're not growing in a greenhouse because of the low light intensities, the short day lengths, as well as the cold temperatures. High tunnels can be used uh, primarily for season extension, but not for year round uh, production. However, again, that year round demand persists. And so, um, you know, we, we really need to find ways of being able to grow these crops in greenhouses. Now, here we have the top 15 uh, cut flowers that are grown in the U.S. And you can see some of the of the ones that you would expect, like tulips, um, sunflowers, peonies, et cetera. Um, and as we go through the uh, presentation today, we'll we'll talk more about uh, many of these. 
Okay, so really what we're gonna be talking today about is that year round production and some of those challenges and where our research has come into play. So again, many cut flowers have specific requirements in order to induce them into flower, which we don't often think about uh, when we're growing them outdoors. Um, one of the most important things, especially if you're growing uh, young plants, um, which will be transplanted into either a high tunnel or even into a greenhouse, is that you need to provide them with non-inductive um, treatments, right? So they don't start to flower prematurely, as well as to uh, get some vegetative growth on the plants prior to inducing those flowers. However, there's been very little research uh, in this area to support year-round greenhouse production, especially for northern latitudes. So one of the main focuses today is going to be looking at light. And when we think about light, we need to th think about three different uh, parameters. One is light quantity or the intensity, which is ultimately for cut flowers going to affect um, the yield as well as the quality of those stems. And then there's light quality or the spectrum, which is going to affect uh, the morphology, right? So in terms of uh, stem length, that can be quite important. And then with many of the cut flowers, they have a light duration or photo period requirement, which is going to subsequently induce flowering. So when we think about um, photo period, uh, let's look at two examples. Here we have Seattle and we have Miami, where there's a, a large difference in the, um, the, the day lengths. And that's going to ultimately affect um, the crops that we're going to be growing and how we are going to induce them into flower. So photo period refers to the duration of light within a day, but it's actually the period of darkness that signals um, the flower induction response for these plants. And there's different responses to photo period. So the three uh, that we typically talk about are day neutral plants, short day plants, as well as long day plants. Let's look at more specifically at what we're talking about. So here we have a uh, cut flower that I would think that most of you are familiar with. This is a Crassopedia. And we can see that when it is grown under day lengths of nine up to 16 hours or a four hour night interruption, that flowering occurs across all those day lengths. This tells us that this is a day neutral plant. So regardless of the day length that you grow it under, it's gonna flower. Okay, so now let's look at uh, some of these uh, responses with long day and short day plants. So we can have a facultative response or a qualitative response where plants will flower more quickly when exposed to an inductive long day, for example, or short day. But regardless of the photo period, those plants will eventually flower. Now, if a plant has an obligate or a quantitative response, it must be exposed to either long days or short days or the plant will remain uh, vegetative. And I'll, I'll show you examples of these. So here we have a, a, a figure where we're looking at both short day plants as well as long day plants. Let's let, look at this short day plant where if we grow it under day lengths less than 12 hours, it's going to flower. Um, so the critical photo period uh, in this instance would be 12 hours. Now let's look at this long day plant where we see that the plants are flowering when the day lengths are longer than 12 hours. So here, we in these two instances, these both have an obligate response because they are not flowering. In the case of the short day plant, when the day lengths are greater than 12 hours, and in the case of the long day plant, when the day length is shorter than 12 hours. Now here, we can see that flowering occurs faster under short days, but it will eventually flower under long days. And then in the um, instance with the long day plant, again, the plants flower faster under long days, but will eventually flower under short days. So these are facultative responses. Okay, so just for a review, here we have long day plants. And again, flowering occurs in response to those long days and short nights. So here's an example of a facultative long day plant, and it's Snapdragon, one of the industry standards, whether it's, uh, well, I should say, as a um, specialty cut flower. So how do we create long days within a greenhouse? Well, we have lots of options. One is what's called night interruption lighting, where you're lighting in the middle of the night, 
for four hours. And this typically occurs between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. We can also use day extension lighting where we turn on the lights right before sunset until the desired photo period is created. Um, so if, for example, you want to create a 16-hour um, a day, you calculate how many hours the sunlight is giving you. And let's say, for example, it's uh, 10 hours, then you would light for an additional six hours to, again, create that 16-hour photo period. Now, one of the things to remember with uh, creating long days is that we're going to use low intensity lighting. And that's typically providing us about two micromoles of light. And that's enough for the plants to perceive a long day. So what types of lamps can we use? Well, there's there's lots of them. Um, those of you that remember uh, using mum lighting, for example, we used to use uh, incandescent bulbs, but those have been phased out of production. And then we started using those uh, Curly Q uh, compact fluorescent lamps. And again, those are, are not typically used because uh, they don't have the correct wavelengths of light. So now we have LED lamps that we can use. Other options are to use um, high intensity fixtures such as a high pressure sodium lamp or a metal halo lamp or again, um, LEDs. So these would be the, the lights that you would use for supplemental lighting, but they can also be used um, again to um, create long days. Um, other options are boom lighting, where um, a fixture is attached to a boom and moved across uh, the plants. So again, the plants perceive a long day or having a rotating uh, reflector, which is referred to as a beam flicker, beam flicker. So here are examples of horticultural um, LEDs that have been uh, produced, again, uh, for use in a greenhouse so they can take the high humidity and they provide the wavelengths of light that uh, plants are going to perceive uh, for a long day. Um, here again is an example of a high tunnel where they were using uh, the screw-in um, compact fluorescent lamps, again, for uh, flower induction. And again, here's an example with uh, lisianthus where you can see, again, that they're using these uh, fixtures. Again, you don't need to provide high light intensities, just anywhere from two to three micromoles is enough. Now, here's an example of uh, boom lighting, where again, we have a, an irrigation boom, and we have in this instance, LEDs that have been attached. Those LEDs go back and forth over the crop. So again, about two to five feet above the crop, and those lamps and booms are operated for about four to six hours during the middle of the night. Um, really, the goal here is to provide the plants with at least, um, you know, to illuminate them for at least uh, once every 20 to 30 minutes. And again, that's enough for the plant to perceive a long day. Here's an example of the uh, beam flicker, which in this case is a high pressure sodium lamp. And it uh, oscillates back and forth at 80, 180 degrees to again, provide that intermittent light to a relatively large area. And again, the plants are going to uh, perceive a, a long day in this, um, with this type of fixture as well. So here's an example where we can see in this greenhouse, they have uh, one beam flicker here and another. And again, that lamp is gonna turn back and forth. And so the plants are going um, to perceive a long day. Now, one thing to remember is you can see this area here that's not, um, doesn't have as much light as, as you see right here. In some instances, depending on the crop, you may see a slight flowering delay here where you may not, uh, you know, you're gonna see much faster flowering directly under that lamp. Okay, now let's change gears and talk about short day plants. So here, the plants are gonna flower um, in response to short days and long nights. So here we have an example of a short day plant, um, which are our uh, marigolds. So how do we deliver short days? Well, uh, we have less options than we do with long days. So we can either have uh, natural short days, which obviously is gonna occur uh, typically during the winter, or we can use black cloth, as we can see in this example, where black cloth, again, is uh, used to um, create a short day. So under long day conditions, um, again, we're only going to be able to uh, provide short day plants with a short day by, again, uh, reducing that day length.
So we're going to want to exclude light from the plants, as we can see in this example. So uh, there's different materials that growers can use. Um, one is just a, a black cloth, or you can have a woven blanket that consists of aluminum and plastic on the outside. And that's going to be beneficial because it's going to reflect the sunlight and not allow as much heat to be trapped in underneath the cloth. Um, some growers will use black plastic, but again, this is not um, the ideal method because you can get condensation as well as the plastic uh, collapsing onto the plants. So one question that I often get is when should we pull <clears throat> or retract that black cloth? Well, it's typically pulled uh, to coincide with the typical work day. So uh, retracted at 8 a.m. and pulled around 5 p.m. Um, again, one of the major problems that can occur, especially um, during the warmer months of the year, is the accumulation of heat underneath the curtain, which can cause heat delay on certain crops. But again, if we're going to be using black cloth for uh, cut flowers, it's typically going to um, not occur during those uh, times of the year. Okay, so there's lots of different systems um, that you can utilize in a greenhouse. Uh, you can have one that goes um, directly over the bench. Obviously, in this situation, uh, cut flowers would be much taller, so you'd want to have a different type of system. Here we have an example where the entire greenhouse has black cloth. So again, this would be ideal for uh, cut flowers. And again, here's an, an individual uh, bench bit where the black cloth is pulled manually. So now we're going to talk about the critical day length. So this day length is basically the photo period that marks the transition from vegetative growth to reproductive growth. And this is going to be different for different uh, plant species and even sometimes within cultivars. So let's look at a long day plant, for example. Uh, and again, this is one that we have made up, um, but we can see that um, under 10 hours, the plants remain vegetative. At 12 hours and beyond or greater, we see that the plants are flowering. So we can see that the critical um, day length is 12 hours. Now let's look at a, a very common crop that most of us are familiar with, um, petunias are considered long day plants. We have some that have an obligate response and we have others that have a facultative response. With this particular cultivar, we can see that the critical photo period is 13 hours, meaning that at day lengths greater than 13 hours, the plants begin to flower and remain vegetative under photo periods less than 13 hours. Now let's look at short day plants and in terms of their critical day length. So here we can see that again, 12 hours is the critical day length because anything under 12 hours, we see flowering above that and the plants remain vegetative. So here we have some examples of uh, a cut flower crops. So we have dahlia, which is considered a uh, facultative short day plant with a critical day length for this particular cultivar of 13 hours. So under 13 hours, we see that flowering occurs faster, but we will eventually see flowers under those greater day lengths and the four hour night interruption. Here we have marigold, which again is also a short day plant with a critical day length of 12 hours. But again, um, again, the plants are flowering faster under these short day lengths, but will eventually flower under those long days. As we can see here, we have flower buds. Okay, so now let's look at a concept that um, is not so familiar to those of us in, in the cut flower industry, uh, but we're actually doing work here at Michigan State uh, to determine this. And it is called the critical cycle number. So let's say that you have a, a short day plant, right? And you don't wanna have to pull black cloth for the entire um, time of, of forcing that crop. Well, uh, with certain plants, we can we have determined that you can give them, let's say, uh, 20 days of, of short days, and that will induce the plants into flower. So it's very similar to the, the uh, critical day length. So here's an example of uh, a plant that is also a, uh, 
a cut flower and it's, it's Cosmos. So it has a short day flowering requirement. And what we can see is that when the plants were provided with zero short days, they did not flower, even after six or 12 short days. But after 18 short days, the plants were induced into flower. So again, this is going to uh, be very beneficial for crops like um, Dahlia, which we are currently working on, so that growers uh, maybe only have to pull black cloth for maybe three weeks instead of during the entire production time and uh, get flowering uh, or having their plants flower faster. Okay, so now let's talk about young plants. So is, there's a very common misconception that um, you need to grow photoperiodic plants under indu inductive day lengths from the very start. And that is the complete opposite of what we want to do, especially with cut flowers, right? One, the one thing that we want to prevent is premature flowering because once those plants start to flower, uh, there's really not a whole lot that we can do. Yes, we can use um, Ethophon or, or Florel or um, Advocate, but um, again, those plants are going to be pretty compact. And what we're looking for is those long stem lengths. Therefore, again, that's one of the reasons why we need to determine that critical uh, photo period. So when should uh, you place short day plants or long day plants under those inductive photo periods and for how, how long? So I'll have some tables as well as an article that I'll share with you uh, where you can find that information. So here's a great example of, of a plant that we've done research on. This is witchgrass uh, or panicum, and it is a short day plant. Uh, we grew the plants under a daily light integral of 10 moles per meter squared per, uh, per day, which we're going to talk about DLI in just a bit. And those young plants were grown under a short day photo period of nine hours. They were then subsequently placed under uh, the finishing photo periods of 10 to 16 hours or that four hour night interruption. And what we can see, I'm not sure how well um, you can see this, but I, obviously because I, I know the research, um, these plants were only about six inches tall when they flowered. So again, this is not a cut flower, showing us that if you grow those um, young plants under a short day, regardless of the photo period that you finish them under, um, you're not gonna get the stem length that uh, is desired. So now let's look at when those young plants were grown under a long day. So in this instance, it was a 16 hour photo period and they were finished under again, the same day lengths of 10 to 16 hours or that four hour night interruption. Because the plants were again, vegetative as a young plant and then placed under short days, this was after 34 days after transplant, we can see that the plants flowered faster under 10 hours as well, um, you know, as the day lengths increased up to about 12 hours. We did eventually see the plants under 13 to 16 hours flower with much larger stem lengths. So again, this is showing you how important it, or, uh, it is to give those young plants um, the opposite photo period of, um, of what the crop needs to flower. So here's a, a photograph of what the plants actually look like in the greenhouse, right? So these were the ones that were finished under a, um, a short day and had received short days as a young plant. So you can see they're very small. And by the time we took the photograph, uh, they were already starting to senesce. Well, those that were finished under a night interruption, we had a lot of vegetative growth. And once they started to flower, we were gonna have these really nice uh, stems. Okay, here's a, a, another great example where we have an obligate long day plant. And so the plants were grown under long days from the very start. And uh, you can see that uh, the stem lengths are not, are not very uh, long, meaning that uh, you know we're not gonna have very marketable stems. So again, um, showing us that those young plants should have been grown under short days during the young plant stage. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of, again, that photo period management? Well, I think we've learned today that inducing, uh, we're gonna be able to induce flowering when it's desired. We're going to be able to prevent premature flowering so that we can get those greater stem lengths, um, as well as achieving those marketable uh, stems. 
and we're going to be able to schedule our crops for specific market dates. So here's some photographs just to show you um, um, in, in a greenhouse the, what the plants look like. So here we have Campanula, which is an obligate long day plant. Now, now not all Campanula are long, obligate long day plants, but in this instance, uh, this one is. So we can see that when it was grown under an 11 hour short day, and three months later, again, the plants remained vegetative. But when they were grown under a four hour night interruption, um, three months later, we can see the crop is in flower and we have stem lengths that are appropriate uh, for this type of cut flower. Now let's move on to another very familiar specialty cut flower stock, which is considered a facultative long day plant. So we can see that under a four hour night interruption, the plants are now in flower. However, when the plants are grown under a long, um, 11 hour short day, uh, we can see a delay in flower, right? So plants are flowering faster under long days, but will eventually flower under short days. Here's another Campanula uh, with this one. It's a facultative long day plant. And again, we see plants flowering faster under long days, but eventually flowering under short days. And lastly, here we are um, looking at sunflower, which is a facultative short day plant. So again, uh, here, plants flowering faster under short days, but will eventually flower under long days. And so from our research, as well as the research of other, um, at other universities and, and within the industry, we have put together a list of facultative long day plants that are used as specialty cut flowers. So what we are showing here is that those plugs or young plants um, should be grown under short days, as well as anywhere from two to weeks after transplant to again, build up that vegetative growth and then place under long days or a four hour night interruption to induce flowering. Now, again, here we have the optimal daily light integral which in most instances is gonna be very difficult to achieve 20 to 30 moles of light uh, during the winter. But again, that is um, again, the optimal. And I'll talk a little bit later of what really what we are able to achieve in a greenhouse. One thing I would like to note is that anemone is also reported as a day neutral plant. So again, it's gonna be dependent on the cultivar. Um, and again, I have a, an article that I will share with you that uh, has all of this information in it. Here we have examples of obligate long day plants. So um, there are a few such as Bachelor's Button and Campanula that are also reported to be facultative long day plants. So again, with these plants, we are gonna wanna grow them under short days as a plug, as well as two to four weeks after transplant, and then provide them with inductive long days. Here's our list of day neutral plants. So here we have a lot of bulbs that are grown as, um, as cut flowers, such as hyacinths, tulips, and daffodils, as well as some others such as uh, gumfrina and cressipedia. So here we can basically grow, no, grow them under any day length as a plug, as well as during finishing, and um, they're gonna flower, again, regardless of that day length. Now let's move on to those facultative short day plants, where, again, we have a list of, of many uh, common plants, right? Um, and with zinnia and sunflower um, having, again, different day lengths, some are reported to be facultative long day plants, as well as day neutral plants. Again, um, very dependent on the cultivar. So it's always really important to um, talk to the breeding company, as well as look at uh, the culture sheets. So with these plants, we are gonna to wanna to grow them under long days during the plug stage, as well as two to four weeks after transplant, and then give them uh, short day photo periods of nine to 12 hours to induce flowering. And then luckily, there are only a few obligate short day plants. So we have Caryopteris and Celosia, um, which again, you're gonna to have to grow under long days uh, for vegetative growth and then under um, longer, excuse me, under shorter days uh, for flower induction. 
Okay. So in conclusion, um, you know, light management for greenhouse specialty cut flower production um, is very important, especially when it comes to photo period, right? As we have seen today, there's many different crops that have different photo periods for both optimal growth or vegetative growth, as well as development. And we're wanna, gonna wanna use photoperiodic lighting to prevent premature flowering and unmarketable stems. We're also gonna want to make sure that we really pay attention to the day length that we are providing to these young plants that we are gonna transplant into the greenhouse because that's gonna have a big effect on subsequent flowering as well as stem quality. So now we are gonna change gears and talk about light quantity. And so uh, with light quantity or light intensity, uh, we need to think about how there's instantaneous light as well as cumulative light. And the cumulative light is really what we should really uh, be uh, measuring, right? Because we wanna know how much light our plants are receiving over the course of the day. Um, and, and even during the course of a growing season. So we have a concept called daily light integral, which is very similar to a rain gauge, right? With a rain gauge, we are measuring the total amount of rain or precipitation that falls within an area over the course of the day. Well, with daily light integral, we are calculating the total number of moles of, of light that fall within one area or a square meter over the course of the day. And why are we concerned with daily light integral? Well, the more light that our plants receive is going to lead to increased plant biomass. But really that means yield, right? Uh, the more light we provide, the more stems we are going to be able to harvest. Those stems are going to have a stronger, um, they're gonna be stronger because they're gonna have an increased stem caliper. Um, in some instances, we will see that flowering occurs faster under higher light, which means that we are going to be able to have more crop cycles in that greenhouse. We may also see more blossoms per stem, larger blossoms, but most importantly, that increased yield, which is going to lead to greater profitability. Here's an example uh, looking at Dianthus where we can see those quality differences, right? We see that we have larger flowers. It's probably a little bit uh, difficult to see that the stems are also uh, larger. But again, under the high DLI, we have a higher quality stem. So that daily light integral um, is gonna be influenced by um, where your greenhouse is located. So unfortunately, for those of us located in Northern latitudes, we can see that during the month of December, right, uh, we have very low light. Uh, when we look at um, the chart here, or the legend, I should say, we get about five to maybe 10 moles of light outdoors. Now, when we move into a greenhouse, we can have a 50% or greater reduction in light. Um, and uh, this is a resource that uh, you can look at uh, on the AFE website. So again, so you can try to determine what the daily light integral is in your region. So for comparison, when we look at the summer months uh, in July, we can see that we have daily light integrals outdoors of anywhere from 40 to 45 moles. Obviously within a greenhouse, um, we're gonna cut that about by about 50%. So how can we boost that daily light integral within our greenhouse? Well, really the only appreciable way is by using supplemental lighting. Uh, this grower, who's again producing uh, lisianthus, is using high pressure sodium lamps to be able to achieve uh, a greater daily light integral and thus increase um, their yield and stem quality. So from our research, uh, we have determined that young plants, um, again, those used for, for specialty cuts, should be grown under a moderate daily light integral of 10 moles or greater. Now, when you're finishing the crop, um, you know, we, we recommend uh, daily light integrals greater than full 14 moles, but in some instances, you're not gonna be able to achieve this. And again, really anything that you can provide greater than what the plants are receiving from sunlight is going to improve your yield and stem quality. 
if you have daily light integrals of five moles, um, unfortunately, you know, this is going to be quite low and you're going to see weak stems um, and leggy inflorescences. So that in those instances, you may want to consider, uh, you know, not growing during the middle of the winter because the quality and yield is going to be greatly reduced. The nice thing is, though, is that you can use high pressure sodium lamps or LEDs uh, providing that pink uh, or purple color or the broadband spectrum, which are typically white, um, to supplement solar radiation. And we have found that uh, really there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of uh, yield as well as even um, time to flower. So with that today, I would like to thank um, the American Floral Endowment, as well as the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers for, for, for providing funding for our research, as well as uh, Syndicate Sales, Rakers Roberta, and Hydro Farm for providing supplies and plant material. I would also like to remind everyone that on Tuesday, December 19th, is the next uh, webinar series for Grow Pro. So for, mo for more uh, information, please go to the American Floral Endowment website. And with that, uh, now I have time to uh, entertain any questions you may have. All righty, Dr. Lopez, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, we're gonna go ahead and open up to questions now. I see we have a bunch here in the chat and the Q&A, but feel free to go ahead and add more in as, as we go ahead and start answering some of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off here um, with Margaret asking if uh, these tips would also work well in Canada. Nice yes, um, most definitely the um, the <clears throat> daily light integrals that we have uh, in the northern U.S. Are, are very similar to those that you have in Canada, as well as even um, the photo period um, recommendations. Awesome. I have a question here from Sue asking if you can uh, do daily day length extension in the morning or if it has to be in the in the evening. Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. Yes, uh, you can do this. Um, actually, some folks prefer to do this um, more so uh, to prevent that uh, accumulation of uh, of heat. Um, so yeah, it it really doesn't uh, matter whether you do it um, uh, in the evening or in the early hours before uh, the sun rises. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. This. This is a long one here from Paula saying, I live in North Idaho. My lisianthus can have a hard time getting stem length here in the in the north. They're fine in the greenhouse, but not so much outside. Do you know what is going on? Um, and does lisianthus for northern growers need extra considerations with any light requirements, either in their early development or later on? An another great question. So uh, we're currently doing research <clears throat> with lisianthus. And what we're I, I wish I I could ask a, a follow up question as to whether you're growing in a high tunnel or in a greenhouse, um, but from what we are seeing, um, Lisianthus is a facultative long day plant, and so if it is receiving long days, whether you're uh, extending the day length or or just uh, when they're flowering, let's say in um, uh, May, for example, uh, <clears throat> that's going to cause the the plants to to be short. And so what we're doing on, in some follow-up studies is actually providing the plants with short days after we take them out of um, their cooling treatment and uh, letting them grow under short days to kind of bulk up the plant so that it doesn't start to, to flower prematurely. And um, another thing that I'll, that I'll mention is that there are folks that find that if you do successive ranunculus planting, so let's say you start to plant them um, in November, January, February, that you're going to find a big difference in quality. So, so stem length, as you indicated, and again, it's mainly because of of the photo, the natural photo period is changing um, once those plants start to to flower. So that that might uh, that was an awesome answer. I think that might answer some of the next uh, part of follow up here from from Paula asking if uh, basically why she might be seeing Campanula, uh, Lisianthus, Ranunculus, Sweet Williams and iberus being short in the field. Um, would you have anything to say more about those ones in particular? Okay, so you said it was uh, Lysianthus, Campanula. Sweet Williams, uh, and iberus. 
and they're and they're short. Yeah. Okay. So all of those plants are <clears throat> are long day plants. And did she happen to say where she's located? Uh, that's up in northern Idaho. Oh, I, I'm sorry, in Idaho. Yes. Yeah, so let's see. So these are long day plants, and um, they're probably going to be flowering for you. I would say in August, uh, late July, August. It probably, I would say, has to do with the um, the young plants that they may not uh, have been given the, the correct photo period. Um, it, it is interesting though that you're, I would expect in the field that they would be of sufficient size. So so maybe uh, if you want, you can send me an email or, or we can talk on the phone and, and, and talk about what other things might be leading to those short stems. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna keep on rolling through here. Got a question here from Kath. Um, Asking if there is a percentage recommendation for shade cloth for short day periods. Or short yeah, so, day. so shade cloth um, cannot be used for um, to create short days. It has to be a black cloth that does not allow any light to come through because the uh, you know it, it's very different from plant to plant. But any light pollution that the plants receive is going to ultimately affect their flowering. So again, it has. It has to uh, prevent any light uh, from reaching the plants. Awesome. All right. I got a lot of communication here in the, the chat box. So I'm just going to go ahead and try to filter through these real quick. One second here. So I see somebody did ask if they'll get a summary of the different flowers, which is short day, long day, and an explanation of the terms. Um, and I know that. Uh, our AFE team actually went ahead and already posted this awesome GPN mag article from you. So I'll, I'll leave that there make sure everybody can see the link there and um, is aware of that. All right. Let me see here. Um, so a question from Elwood over here asking if, uh, saying thank you, awesome job with the presentation um, and was asking if the slides will be available afterwards. Yes, and, and AFE will be making those available. Yep. Yeah, and the, the whole presentation will also be available on, on the YouTube page, along with closed captions in other languages um, for people who might not have English as their first language. Um, all right, here we go. Question from Maria. What about SNAP group one and two? Do I need to provide extra light midday to increase the intensity of the light i'm in oregon and we have cloudy days in the winter yes so you would definitely uh <clears throat> need to provide light to to get those uh, uh snapdragons in the various series to to flower uh faster that's going to hasten the flowering awesome all right and then another question about past webinar recordings being available um our AFV team went ahead and, and linked our YouTube link with uh, where this uh, webinar will be posted as, as well as all of our previous ones. And I'm gonna circle back here to the chat. So I got another Q and A, man, everyone's going off with questions. I love this, this is awesome. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> so Lindsay is uh, saying, has this here, I'm growing long day plants in a greenhouse near Portland, uh, near Portland, Oregon this winter. There are currently compact fluorescent screwing lights but they're looking to transition to LED lights to correct the wavelength of the lighting. Do you have any specific light bulb recommendations or where is a good place to find this information? Can you use the same bulbs for night interruption as supplemental lighting? That's an awesome question. Okay, so let, lots of uh, questions there. <laughs> um, so the short answer is yes, you can go to a, um, a hardware store, big box store and purchase LEDs that you would use in your home. Uh, but the the one caveat there is that these lamps are um, created for an indoor home environment, right? So in a greenhouse, um, you know, the conditions are wet. I've seen many instances where these bulbs uh, have filled up with, with water due to the high humidity in the greenhouse. And obviously that is not uh, always safe. Um, while, and again, they're, they're much cheaper than the horticultural LEDs that have been uh, develop for these high humidity uh, conditions. So as, as I said, you can use those um, 
for flowering, but um, they don't contain far red light, which the horticultural LEDs uh, have. And so that's going to, uh, with some plants, not all, uh, you may see a delay in, in flowering. So um, while you can use them, it's probably best to spring, uh, you know, and pay a little bit more for those uh, horticultural LEDs. And in the slides, uh, there's three currently um, different manufacturers that produce them. So uh, Philips, GE, as well as uh, Ventus Lighting all have these what are referred to as flowering lamps. Now, uh, in terms of your question, and um, supplemental lighting is, is very different. So these low intensity screw in uh, bulbs are just for photoperiodic lighting, right? You're gonna provide anywhere from two to three micromoles. But if you wanna provide supplemental lighting, you're gonna to have to use a fixture that is going to provide a, a much higher intensity. Um, and typically for cut flowers, and one thing I didn't mention in, in the talk, is for cut flowers, we're gonna to wanna to provide anywhere between 90 to 150 micromoles of light. So a lot more light um, than you would provide with photoperiodic lighting. Awesome. I think that just about answers everything you have there, Lindsay. All right. Um, so on that note, another question here is, how, how would you determine how many light fixtures you need for supplemental lighting? Great question. So um, this is, is a question they get quite a bit from growers. Um, and this is something that you would have to work with the manufacturer, right? So if it's a good manufacturer, they're gonna give you these, uh, you know, you, you're gonna tell them, uh, this is the light intensity that I want uh, to provide my crops. This is the height that I have from um, from the crop to uh, to the highest point in the greenhouse. And so then they will tell you, this is how many fixtures you're gonna need and um, also the uniformity, right? So the uniformity throughout the greenhouse is really important. If it's less than 80%, I probably would move on to a different manufacturer, right? Because you wanna have good uniformity throughout the greenhouse. Um, so it's not something that I can tell you just because it's based on um, the size of your greenhouse, the light intensity, um, every fixture is different. But again, work with reputable, um, LED or, or HPS manufacturers, and they will uh, be able to provide you with a light uh, map and plan. So this, I got a follow up here from, from Paula, who is uh, our grower in, in Northern Idaho, asking about some smaller plants. And I, I think this is a good opportunity to talk about some morphology questions. So she mentioned that uh, she noticed that if her flowers are in the shade of sunflowers, they get taller. Um, and she's asking about if it has to deal with the, the lighting intensity. Yeah, so uh, there's some phenomenon called the shade avoidance response that that plants have. So right, well, just think about a, in a canopy or if you go into a forest and you have little plants growing under those trees, right? Their um, main intent, right, is, is to try to grow taller so that they can reach uh, more sunlight. And what happens in, in a canopy is those tall trees or, or, the, or your sunflower are primarily taking up the red light and the blue light and they're transmitting and reflecting far red light. So when those other uh, plants that are underneath the sunflowers are uh, receiving that far red light, their inclination is, right, I'm, I'm getting this far red light so I need to grow taller to uh, basically outcompete my my neighbor and uh, reach the sun. Hopefully, Hopefully that made sense, but but it's a, a very common thing. Right? Think about um, if you're growing poinsettias and, and the leaves start to touch, right? What's going to happen? Those plants are going to start to to stretch, and it's it's all because of that far red light. Awesome. That's a great response there. So a question here from Maria um, saying that the Snap G1 needs 1,500 foot candles. Um, how should she find the, the right light? Um. So I guess in terms of the question, I'm not sure if she's asking about um, the correct um, wavelength of light. Um, so so I guess I, I believe what she's asking in terms of 1500 foot candles, you're not gonna be able to provide um, that amount of light with uh, photoperiodic lighting, right? You're gonna have to use supplemental light. So it, it doesn't really matter whether the fixtures are providing white light or that pink or purple, um, again, it's gonna have to be high intensity for, for 1500. 
All right. I think we are mostly through. Oh, here we I got another one here. Um, so a question from Deb asking if there is a relationship between soil temp and, and light as well. No. Soil temp. So I guess the, the temperature of the of the soil, um, if you're growing in the ground, um is definitely going to have an effect on time to flower, right? So temperature affects uh, the rate of development. So when we think about the rate of development, it's going to affect time to visible bud, time to first flower. And so it's going to interact with uh, light and ultimately affect your crops. So, uh, you know, most growers are concerned with the, the air temperature, right? It's the easiest temperature that we can monitor and, and measure and and change within the greenhouse, but that soil temperature is also uh, quite important. And so it's, uh, you know, it's ultimately going to have an effect on on your crop. I think this will be one of the last ones here. Actually, I got a couple more. All right, so just a, a follow up. I I got from from Maria. Um, Asking about the fifteen hundred foot candles for for snaps and finding the right light. If you if you have any recommendations for finding the grow light with the right intensity and how to go about finding grow lights that might be used for uh, supplemental lighting instead of just that interruption. Yes. So, so for supplemental lighting, um, as I indicated before, uh, with uh, cut flowers, the general recommendation is to provide around ninety to one hundred and fifty micromoles of light. Um, there's many uh, you know, manufacturers that, that produce uh, these supplemental lighting fixtures. Um, as a, an employee of Michigan State University, I can't recommend a, a particular uh, fixture, but what I can tell you is to you know make sure and talk to other growers and ask them you know what uh, what have your experience has been um, with these various you know fixtures. Um, you know, there's there's just like I said, many out there, um, and so the the best way is is um, either trialing some, you know, it's getting a few of of each and and determining how well they they work in your your greenhouse, but also talking to you, to your grower colleagues. Right, and uh, I guess oh, I got one more here from from Jorge or from George. In order to save energy, do you think? uh is equivalent to give some light shot something like a lightning uh lighting in a storm instead of long periods of lighting let's see so um if you remember back i i talked about uh cyclical lighting where you uh where you can have a boom or that uh, beam flicker that has the the light that that comes back and forth that's um it has to be a certain intensity, right? That the plant accumulates that light in order for it to uh, perceive a long day. So just a, a flash of light, um, you know, every, just once during the night is not gonna be enough for the plant to perceive a long day. So uh, passing the light every, let's say 20 to 30 minutes uh, for a four hour period, that's gonna be enough for again a plant to perceive a, a long day so I, I hear where you're coming from in, in wanting to uh, you know minimize the uh, amount of electricity that you use but but there is a, a minimum uh, both intensity as well as duration that the plant has to accumulate in order to perceive a, a long day awesome well i'd like to thank everyone this was an awesome presentation so um lots of awesome feedback and questions here from from our attendant uh, attendees and uh, as as well as Dr. Lopez. So, going to go ahead and wrap up. Want to thank everyone for joining us today for another session of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series. Um, and I want to invite everybody to join us next month for Dr. James Altland's presentation on technologies and strategies on sustainable substrates and containerized crop production. Um, that'll be on Tuesday, December nineteenth at one p.m. Eastern time. You can register at endowment.org/growpro. And while you're there, check out our past webinar recordings, other grower-related resources, and research reports available to you for free, thanks to our industry support. 
We ask that you please com uh, complete a brief survey about today's session where you can suggest additional topics and help us continue to improve these webinars. I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us and wish everyone a great day. Thank you all.